gentlemen. No, Mia. Sorry, my dog is very displeased about some people walking around outside because that's just, you know, her territory. And uh, anyway, all right. So um, how's everybody doing this afternoon? Hopefully uh, pretty decent, I hope. Um, so, um, all right, so what um, what we're going to do is uh, continue our discussion of assembly code. Um, so just kind of a quick recap um, from last time. Uh, High-level code, something like Python, C, Java, you know, those sorts of things, Scratch even, um, uh, are meant to be human readable and uh, also to some extent platform independent. Um, and then um, the uh, a compiler takes that and turns it into assembly code, which is platform specific or architecture specific. Uh, and then the, an assembler turns that into the actual machine code that's actually executed by the processor. Um, OK, so uh, let me go back to um, uh, let's go back to. Um, our little emulator, uh, courtesy of our dear friend Joel, and I'm going to try and blow up the the uh, size here if my computer will cooperate. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, so we'll go over to uh, full screen here. Um, the uh, what we were looking at last time was this thing, which is basically our little simulator for our machine. So um, what we have here, right, was the program counter, and on this particular architecture, the program counter must start at zero zero. So your program has to start in the very first cell of memory. Uh, on, on real architectures, that limitation is not, um, uh, not present. Um, but uh, for, for demonstration purposes, this architecture does that. Um, so the very first instruction has got to be in the very beginning of memory. Uh, and then you've got 256 bytes worth of memory to work with. So that ranges from cell 00, 0 is the first one, all the way to cell FF is the last one. Um, so that's a total of 256 cells. Then you have uh, your general purpose registers. Um, and there are 16 of them labeled 0 through F. Um, for reasons that we'll talk about later, do not use register 0. Um, and, and I'll explain why and when you should use it later. Um, but that means that you've got 15 others to work with. This, by the way, is relatively luxurious in terms of the number of available registers. Um, having 16 of them is really quite, quite handy um, because it means that uh, you can keep a lot of things in register memory instead of actually out in memory memory. Now, just for comparison's sake, let's go to um, the bastion of all knowledge of Western civilization. And uh, let me just sort of show you a couple of other processors of the era uh, or that would be sort of similar in era to what we're working with. And the first one that I'm going to look at uh, for you guys er, or show you is the MOS 6502. And the reason I bring this one up is because I guarantee that almost everybody uh, in the class has used one before because um, it was used by... Um, Many uh, process or many uh, computers or game systems that you guys probably played with at some point. So, uh, in particular, 
you guys probably played with a Nintendo, uh, the the original 8-bit Nintendo, uh, you know, maybe back when you were kids. Uh, that was probably one of the most famous systems to use this particular processor. Um, so, uh, can we get a shout out? How many of you guys had uh, or played with an original Nintendo back when you were kids? Anybody? Anybody at all? Okay. Jimmy, you didn't. All right, so what, what Nintendo, or what was uh, everybody's... Atari, okay, that's pretty old school. Uh, SNES and GameCube. Um, yeah, all right, so was the SNES most... Uh, who had an SNES, Super Nintendo, when you were, when you were a kid? All right, so the SNES actually used the successor processor to this one, uh, which was called the 65816, which was a 16-bit uh, processor um, that uh, was sort of developed basically to um, be still compatible with 6502 stuff, but um, uh, but to be similar enough that um, programmers could kind of get used to it. Okay, so anyway, so this is a processor that uh, if you haven't actually played on real Nintendo hardware, then you guys have probably played, uh, well, for example, um, if anybody has a Nintendo Switch, uh, there's the Nintendo or Super Nintendo uh uh, games that they that Nintendo has basically um, uh, ported to uh, the Switch, and uh, if you've got Switch Online or whatever it is that that lets you get to it, then you can play a bunch of the classic 8-bit uh, Nintendo games or some of the 16-bit Super Nintendo games. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, many of you guys have have used sort of these things. Uh, before or played uh, games with them and so what I wanted to kind of talk about was the technical end of how many registers this thing had and uh, this is what's kind of crazy about it it had basically three um, which is kind of crazy when you think about it uh, that's not a whole lot so it had basically the only general purpose register that you could use with it was this register called A. It had two index registers called X and Y. It had a stack pointer. Our processor doesn't have a stack pointer. Um, we'll talk about this, the idea of a stack later. Um, it had a program counter, which was 16 bits for it because it could address uh, 64 kilobytes of memory rather than just 256 bytes. Uh, and then it had this special register uh, called the flag register, and basically each bit of it represented some different important piece of information. Um, so, um, anyway, that's all that this thing had. Not a whole lot. Uh, in terms of registers. So what that meant is that you had to use memory a lot more uh, than, than we will on our processor. Now another common processor of the period was the Z-Log Z80. Um, and the Z80 uh, was uh, basically a guy who used to work at Intel. They left Intel back in the day and then developed their own company and the Z80 uh, was the processor that uh, they developed. Um, it was notable because it was used in a lot of arcade games. Uh, in particular, the original Pac-Man arcade game uh, used this processor. And um, uh, so, you know, you probably haven't played the original Pac-Man on a um, uh, in an arcade. I mean, because those machines would be, you know, basically 40 years old at this point. Uh, but anyway, the um, so let's look at the uh, 
the registers for it and here's sort of um, here's the the register set that it had it had a lot more that you could work with um, it had um, basically uh, eight registers 16 if you count these quote alternate ones and I don't want to go into the details about that you had some index registers a stack pointer uh, a couple of other uh, things uh, but in particular you basically had seven uh, eight bit registers um, it also had kind of an interesting um, uh, thing where you could combine two registers together and use them one 8-bit or sorry two 8-bit registers as a single 16-bit register um, which was sort of interesting but you had a lot more registers here and so the processor could store information temporarily and wouldn't have to work with memory um, but the one of the things that you maybe notice is that because this processor has a lot more registers and a lot more kind of features, uh, the die size, meaning how many transistors it took to build one of these things, uh, the 6502 only took about 25% the die area, so about 25% the number of transistors. That made it a lot cheaper and that's one of the reasons that it was adopted by so many machines was because it was so inexpensive. Um, and in many cases, it could outperform uh, the Z80. Um, okay, so um, anyway, so that's just, uh, I wanted to give you a sort of a sense for uh, what... Um, the uh, what processors sort of of the 70s era looked like and uh, sort of by way of comparison to our particular machine. So our particular machine uh, is much more memory limited. It only has 256 bytes of memory, um, but it does have 16 registers. And if you're really careful, you can get away with only using a few of them at a time. Uh, at the expense of memory. Okay, so let's go back over to, um, let's go to Adam. Here's the icon here. Okay, and um, let's start writing some more programs. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this over there. And then on the left-hand side of the screen, I want to pull up, um, I want to pull up the um, uh, the notes. Um, am I signed in here? No, I am not. Okay, let me actually just use Chrome because I know I've got that signed in. Okay, so let me load this document here. All right, so here's our reference sheet uh, for the different operations that we have available on this processor. So let's just uh, kind of go back through them and remind ourselves of what they are. So the first two uh, we can load data from a, either a memory cell uh, to a specific register, or we can load a particular bit pattern, a particular number into a register. Okay, the, the mnemonics for these are both load, but what's different about them is the opcode. We have opcode 1 for memory to register and opcode 2 for specific number to register. Uh, we can take data from a register and put it back out into memory. We can move register or move data from one register to another. Uh, we can add registers either as um, floating point or as um, integers. Uh, we won't use the floating point addition uh, for a couple of reasons. 
uh, then we can also do logical or and XOR, rotation, which is uh, bit shifting basically, and uh, then the jump command, which we'll talk about maybe on Friday. We'll see how kind of how do we go. Um, so last time we wrote a uh, program that took two specific numbers, the numbers two and three, because I just picked those for sake of uh, for example, and uh, added them together and then output the answer into a memory cell. Okay, so this time let's write a new program. Um, and let me save the file real quick so that I can use this, uh, upload this later. Um, so I was looking at the original uh, source code for the Atari, uh, which actually I'll open up in a minute because I think it's kind of interesting uh, uh, just to show you guys what uh, some of it looks like. All right, so... Um, okay, and then I'm going to change this to uh, just sort of generic ASM. Uh, okay, so uh, the program that I want to write is, let's just say, for example, suppose three numbers are in memory at cells um, F... 0, F1, and F2. Add them in cell FF. Okay, so last time we loaded specific numbers into memory. This time we'll load whatever happens to already be in memory. Um, Okay, and uh, there's a couple ways that we could write this program, so there, there's not necessarily any wrong answer, or uh, there's more than one way to, to do this. Um, but let's, uh, let's start by, uh, well, the first thing we need to do is we need to load in the first number into a register. All right, so what register do I want to load the first number into? Well, how about register 1? And where are we loading it from? We're going to load it from cell F0. All right, then I need to load another register with the next number, another register with the number after that. Okay, so, or, and actually I, uh, yeah. All right, now, I, um, I could have used register 0 here, but I deliberately chose not to for reasons that will become clear later on, um, probably Friday, that uh, you want to avoid using register zero except for one specific situation, and we'll talk about that later. Um, okay, so I've loaded all three of these into registers. Now I need to start adding them together. So I want to add as integers registers one and two, and put the answer someplace. So I'm going to put that answer in register 4. Okay. Um, and then I need to, so register 4 has the sum of the first two numbers. And so to get our final answer, all we have to do is add the third number onto that. So I could do, for example, 5 and then take 3 and 4. So three has the second, or the, sorry, the third number in it. Four has the sum of the first two, and then I'm going to put the answer in register five. Um, okay. So any questions up until here? So the first three commands load our three numbers from memory into our uh, registers. The last two commands do the addition, and notice that you can only do you can only add two numbers at a time. If you want to add more than that, then you have to do it in multiple uh, steps. So any questions on this part?
uh, the first number is the register. What do you mean, Filippo? Oh, okay. So <clears throat> F0 or F1 or F2, same thing. Uh, these are, yeah. Okay, it's you've got it backwards. Uh, so Felipe's question is, what's coming from register one, and where is F zero? Um, Filippo, mute that, please, so I don't have to hear myself. Um, okay, so uh, it's backwards. The load, um, the the source of the information is F0, and the destination for that information is register 1. Okay, so this, um, this actually looks backwards from what you'd think. So we're not loading 1 into F0, we're loading the contents of F0 into register 1. Okay, and the syntax for this assembly language and many assembly languages are like this. The destination is listed first, not second. Okay, um, that's just the the way that it uh, it is. Okay, um, so what this is going to do uh, is uh, take whatever is in memory cell F0, whatever's there, and stick it into register one, okay? So this would be like, let's say that I sent you to the basement of Sparks with 16 buckets uh, labeled zero through F, and I told you to go to mail a box number 37 and take the letter that you find and put it into bucket number one. Well, you'd go and whatever you found in mailbox 57, you'd stick in bucket number one, that's basically what this is. Cell F0 is a cell in memory, and we know that it's in memory because uh, the convention here is to put a dollar sign in front of memory addresses as opposed to specific numbers. Um, and um, then uh, whatever's there gets loaded into address, or sorry, register number one. Then the second and third commands do the exact same thing, but they're going to take uh, cell F1 and put it into register 2, and cell F2 and put it into register 3. So same idea, just, just one number up. Um, okay, so uh, somebody asked, is multiplication possible? Is that too much or too advanced slash much of a tangent? Um, so the answer is yes and no. There is not a single command to do multiplication. Um, as you can see, there's not one here. Uh, but it is possible to do multiplication. Uh, what you would have to do is basically program um, the, well, OK. You guys all learned multiplication in school uh, using one of a couple of methods, right? So. Uh, there's the Russian peasant method, the quarter square method, the lattice method. Um, there's the sort of standard method that like me and my parents and everybody has learned uh, for doing multiplication. And basically what you would have to do is write a program that goes through and does that. So it's completely possible uh, to do it. Um, it is possible also to do multiplication as just repeated addition. So for example, if I wanted to do three times five, I could just do five plus five plus five three times, and that would do it. Um, it's not particularly efficient or elegant, uh, but it works uh, with uh, one asterisk that maybe we'll talk about later. Um, so yeah, you are limited, you are limited to, um, Damn it, Filippo. Okay, who's transmitting? Oh, that's Reese. 
That's such a Reese thing to do. All right, yeah, I'm muting your butt. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Reese, for that, oops, that interruption. Uh, okay, so where were we before we were so rudely interrupted? Um, so, uh, yeah, these are the 12 instructions that you have at your disposal. And these 12 instructions are enough to do basically any program that you could write that does not involve recursion uh, that's also short enough to fit in 256 bytes of memory. So multiplication is completely possible and um, as are sort of other things. So for example, programming division with remainder and uh, other stuff like that. Um, um, all completely possible. Okay, but back to our program. We're just going to add the two numbers, the first two numbers together, and then add the third number to the result. And then I said that I wanted to store this data back out into memory somewhere. And so I could do so by storing register 5. Well, where do we want to stick the answer? I chose that we would stick it in cell FF. And now, uh, Y, F0, F1, F2, and FF, that's just what I picked for sake of example. Um, and once we've stored our data, there's nothing left to do. And so we just need to halt execution. Okay. So now, what we need to do... Um, by the way, in assembly, uh, generally speaking, um, if you put a semicolon, then anything that comes after the semicolon is considered a comment and is ignored by the assembler. So you can type in basically stuff to help you as you go. All right, so any questions on the assembly that we've written? What we're about to do is translate this into the machine code, put it into our system, and then actually execute it and see it uh, see it work. All right. So any questions on the assembly? Okay. So the question is: You mentioned wanting to put the sum into. Uh, FF, yet you put something into FF yourself. Why? Well, I haven't actually put into anything into FF. This is the only command that touches memory cell FF. And so it's going to take, and the, here I know it's the syntax is backwards, the um, register 5's contents will get stored to FF. So uh, let's look at the store syntax here. Um, this would be this line. It store R comma X Y stores the contents of register R in the memory cell X Y. Okay, so I realize that that's sort of backwards. Why is it switched the syntax? <sighs> yes, I know it's it's backwards. Um, so the reason is well okay there's a couple reasons so let's look at this table you see the opcode table uh the opcode table lists everything in a particular order okay and that order was defined by somebody other than me okay that was defined by the authors of our textbook and um what I did was made up the assembly to go with it, which is the stuff under the mnemonic, the operand, those two columns. And so when I did that, I wanted to keep the order of the operands the same as the order that they would be written in your opcodes, okay? And uh, for consistency. Now, what it means though, is because the order of the stuff in the opcodes is inconsistent because the textbook author made it inconsistent. That means that 
my operand scheme here and our, my mnemonic scheme for the assembly are also somewhat inconsistent. Um, so I'm sorry about that. Um, you guys, I guess, will just get used to it. Um, and I mean, I suppose I could go through and just totally redefine everything, uh, but uh, then I would break a bunch of programs that I've already written and whatnot. So yes, I realize that is a little bit frustrating that the order is different for different operations. Um, uh, the order that you list the operands is different for different operations. Uh, sorry. Um, in this case, it's only maybe one quarter my fault and 25 quarters, or 25 quarters, the three quarters, the uh, fault of the textbook authors. Um, okay. So, um, so other than that, are we okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so store uses the same kind of operands as the load instruction does. It's just where are you coming from and where are you going to? So with store, right, I mean, maybe this is one way to think about it, that storing, you're going from a register to memory. If you're going from memory to register, then you're loading. So, yeah. Um, okay. So what we need to do next, and this is why having the order, uh, the way that we've ordered everything will actually speed our task up, is we need to translate, so let me blow this up a little bit more. We need to translate each of the instructions into its corresponding um, machine code. All right, so. If I want to load a register with a specific memory cell's contents, that's opcode number one. So operation one, which register am I going to? Register one. What memory cell am I coming from? Memory cell F0. Okay, so um, why don't you guys in chat tell me what the assembly, or sorry, the machine code would be for the next two load instructions. So what is uh, load 2 F1? What's that going to be? And what is load 3 F2 going to be? So if you could type that in the chat, um, then just to see how you guys are following along. OK, so Code Red. Uh, who is Code Red, by the way? <coughs> Excuse me one second. Sorry. I was dying for a second. All right, so Teague says 12F1 and 13F2. Do you guys agree with him? Any disagreement? And Teague's correct. That works. Okay, so... The first, uh, the first uh, hexadecimal character is a one uh, because we're doing operation type number one. The second uh, thing is one, two, or three corresponding to which register uh, we're dealing with. And then the third and fourth thing are F0, F1, and F2 uh, corresponding to which memory cell we're coming out of. Okay, now we need to do the addition. Okay, so um, first off, which opcode are we using? What kind of addition are we doing? Well, we're adding as integers, so this is why I called it add i for integer. Uh, that's operation number five, and then we're adding, the answer goes into register four, and the two pieces that we uh, are adding together came from registers one and two. I could have also done that, okay? Uh, and I would have gotten exactly the same result. And the reason is, of course, that adding two numbers, it doesn't matter which order you do it in, okay? But I'll, um, I'll just stick with this one. 
Similarly, this would be 5534, adding registers 3 and 4 together, putting the answer in register 5 and its operation type 5. Then store is operation type 3. What register? Register number 5. What memory cell? FF. And then the halt is always C000. Okay. Um, okay, so there are all, uh, in this case, seven instructions for our program. Six that actually do anything, and then one that terminates the, uh, the operation of the program. Okay, uh, so uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write those in order. Um, or I could copy and paste them, and I'll show you why I'm doing this in a second. Okay, so I'm going to copy that sequence of stuff. Okay, so basically I just took each of my commands and wrote them all in one big line. Then I'm going to go back to... Uh, the, oops, the Brookshire emulator, okay, here, and I'm going to go ahead and full screen this for, for a second, and I've got that other stuff in my clipboard. So, here's what's nice, is if you hit, um, let me just put something in memory here, and then I hit this button then you notice that the URL has a hashtag and then the contents of the memory. So what I can do is I can paste in that sequence, hit enter, and then refresh it, and then it will load in everything into the memory cells in the order that I gave it to. Okay. Um, and... Uh, so that way I don't have to sit here and type 1, 1, F, 0, etc. I can just copy and paste from my previous program and it'll load everything in automatically for me. Um, that will be particularly convenient when you have um, uh, larger programs. Okay, so Filippo's question, what are the gray numbers again? Uh, the numbers to the right this is, so what I've got highlighted is the actual machine code that goes with this instruction in assembly. Okay, so remember, what does 11F0 really mean? That means a binary bit pattern, okay? It would mean 0001, 0001, 1111, 0000, okay? So that's 16 bits worth of stuff. So that's what the machine, the, the processor, actually is going to be reading in, right? Ultimately, everything on a processor is just ones and zeros. And so uh, we have to translate it from our assembly into the machine code. Then I just copied and pasted all of them in order here, and that loads them into my machine. Okay, now... Uh, we were supposed to add numbers that were in cells F0, F1, and F2. Right now, there's nothing there, so let me put some numbers in there that I'm just going to pick at random. Well, here, let me pick smaller numbers. Okay, so 3, 4, 5, the sum of which is 12, and now let's run our program and see what we get. Okay, so uh, I'm going to step through it nice and slow uh, so we can see what we're doing. All right, so uh, actually let me uh, start over. So initially the program counter is 0, 0. That is pointing to the very first memory cell um, on our machine. Okay, and it's the program, or the, sorry, the machine is going to load in that memory cell and the one right after it and whatever it loads in is its first instruction. Okay, so it does that. 
and the instruction register, the instruction that we're going to be working with, is 11F0. Okay, well what does that say to do? That says to load the contents of memory cell F0 into register 1, and then it's going to execute it, and so we had O3 down here in this memory cell, now O3 appears in this register. Okay, my program counter got incremented, so now it's 0, 2, so now I'm going to be looking at this cell next, and it, the one next to it, and that loads in my second instruction, 1, 2, F1, okay, which is now in the instruction register. Well, what does it mean to do? It means take memory cell F1 and stick it in register 2, do it, and now O4, which uh, was sitting down here in memory, has been copied into the register right there. Okay, and if I step this again, uh, the program counter loaded in 13F2, decoded it to say, all right, it's going to take whatever's in memory cell F2 and move it into register 3. It executes that, and now 3, 4, and 5, our first, our three numbers, have been loaded from memory into our processor so that we can actually add them together. Okay, so now the program counter is 06, so the next instruction that's going to get loaded is 5412. Okay, so that's my instruction. What did that mean to do again? It meant to add two numbers together. So it's going to take registers 1 and 2, add them together, and put the answer in register 4. 3 plus 4 is, of course, 7. And so 7 now appears in register 4. Next instruction, 5534 is going to do what? Add registers 3 and 4, stick the answer in register 5. All right, so now here's the fun part. What is the sum of 0, 5 and 0, 7? Uh, so if you could type in the uh, chat, what is the sum of 0, 5 and 0, 7? Somebody other than Teague, how about that? <laughs> Sorry, Teague. I have to torture everybody somewhat, right? I mean, you work it out too, but uh, let's see. Let's get an answer from another victim. And... Uh, I'm going to look at the users in the chat here, and so I might start picking on somebody here, if unless somebody somebody goes ahead and answers. Of course, I know what it is. You guys don't want to be wrong for the whole internet to see. Mm, who, which victim should I pick? Hmm. What's the question? All right. What is zero five plus zero seven? This is not rocket science, gentlemen. Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> Filippo, try again. Okay, all right, so thank you, Filippo, for being my patsy. Is the answer 12? No, the answer is 0x0c. Because everything is in hexadecimal on this machine, guys, right? So now, what is 0x0c? Yeah, that's the number in base 10 that we call 12, okay? So, um, so yeah, so, Filippo, you're, you're both wrong and right.
okay? The value is 12, but the actual number in as it or 12 encoded in hexadecimal is 0c. Okay? So when you look at the numbers here, you have to remember, oh, this is all in hex, not in base 10. And uh, so don't forget that. Uh, now you know why I was torturing you so much with hexadecimal. Okay, so now that we've got our sum, we need to store it out into memory. So we do that. And now look, 0c has appeared down in um, Um, has appeared down in memory, and then our last instruction is the halt instruction, which to execute that basically just terminates uh, machine execution, and that's it. Okay, so yes, every number that's in this machine is encoded in hex, right? So anything that you're typing in is a hex number, and so if you wanted to type in the number 12, you would actually type in 0c, because that's its hex representation. Okay, so uh, just just keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, we can change the numbers, and um, well, let's for example, let me switch the order of them. Uh, we should get the same answer, right? If um, if I change the order, okay. So I just change the order of the three input numbers. And what I'm going to do this time is hit clear and run, and then what will do happen is that each step of the operation, uh, fetch, decode, execute, will take uh, half a second to, to uh, be performed. So what this means is it takes one and a half seconds for each operation um, to complete or each cycle to complete that means this machine is operating at a whopping 0.67 hertz um, which is painfully slow but it's slow enough that you can watch it and get a sense for the operation and lo and behold we still get the same answer okay um, all right so um, we're getting close to 1600, so let's just kind of recap for a moment. Um, that what we did was we started with the idea for a program that in this case I just wrote in English. Um, and we then wrote the assembly code, which is the stuff on the left, uh, to perform those operations. And then once we had the assembly code, each assembly instruction translates one-to-one -to, -one to a machine code version, which is the stuff that we write in hexadecimal. Uh, I put all of that in order so that I could load it into memory, um, and then I just executed it on my little simulator. Okay, so I'll put a little link to this emulator uh, on uh, Canvas. We'll be using it quite a lot for the rest of the semester. Um, okay, so the last thing I wanted to, to just kind of show you guys, because I think it's sort of interesting, is um, let me open, um, let's see, where was I? I was in the Atari uh, stuff. I wanted to show you guys basically uh, some real assembly code. Okay, so uh, this was the... Um, this is the source code for one of the versions of the original Atari game that launched in 1982. Um, and um, so it looks pretty, uh, pretty incomprehensibly uh, unreadable. But here, for example, these are... Um, these are actually assembly instructions for the 6502 processor. Um, so this is a particular port um, uh, of Pac-Man for the 6502, um, as opposed to, say, the original arcade version would have used uh, the Z80 processor. Um, and that assembly looks slightly different. Okay, but each one of these lines, and we don't have to really understand what they mean, uh, is um, going to do something, 
and so each line corresponds exactly with a particular machine code operation. Um, and because Pac-Man is a pretty sophisticated game, it's got lots and lots of code, and this is just one file of the um, of the source code. There's actually quite a bit more, um, and so yeah, it's a uh, uh, pretty pretty ridiculous uh, looking. And obviously, we're not going to do this sophisticated kind of assembly, um, but uh, uh, you know what? When I defined the assembly language that we're working with. When I made this up last year, basically what I was doing was trying to mimic real assembly uh, from real processors as closely as possible. And the reason for doing that was those of you who are going to um, go on in computer science, and especially those of you who are considering majoring in it, um, I wanted this to serve as sort of an introduction that you could look back on when you get to, uh, you know, other classes or where you're looking at real assembly. Um, okay, so I'll just uh, I'll just end with kind of one other one other thing that I think is really cool. Um, so I found this website a while ago, and one of the things that's cool about it is you can actually do basically NES game programming without having an actual NES. And uh, so here they've got a bunch of demonstrations, some of which are written in C, and some of which are written in assembly. And so you can kind of look through and see what exactly, um, what exactly the program is doing. And, uh, I mean, you have to know 6502 assembly. But what's particularly nice about this is that on the left here, there's this little column which shows us, so for example, where is the very first instruction? Well, on the 8-bit Nintendo, uh, the way things were defined was that um, the, um, uh, the very first... Um, um, the very first instructions had to be stored at memory cell 8000. Okay, that was basically halfway through the 16, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, halfway through the 16-bit address space. Uh, and then each line of assembly corresponds exactly to one machine code operation, and it shows you what these are. So, for example, the machine code operation JSR, whatever it does, the first instruction for those uh, is always the same, okay? And uh, then similarly for um, load A with the number zero, the instruction to load A is A9 in hex, and what you load it with is zero, zero, that's listed second. Okay, so the operation is listed first here. So 20 is JSR, st store A is 8D, load A is A9, let's find another one, jump uh, is 4C, and so on, right? Um, okay, so uh, that's what kind of real assembly from the 80s, would have, 70s and 80s would have looked like, and it was this kind of assembly language that uh, inspired me to write this the way that I did. Um, okay, anyway. All right, so we'll quit here. If you guys have questions, hit me up on Discord. Um, I'll post, be posting a bunch of stuff to Canvas uh, later today. Um, so please, um, please have a peek at, at Canvas. Uh, you should get notifications. I'll, I'll send an announcement when I've posted a bunch of stuff. All right, have a good rest.